when I first came to Derek, I was a horrendous putter. He can speak to it. My dad tried to help me with putting, and we just bashed heads. It was too much with swing and putting. So Derek dove in. I'd consider myself to be an incredibly good putter now. Yeah, I have a very tight-knit team. So when I'm home, I'm with him, you know, all the time. It's, it's what I do the most. I, I don't spend as much time with my dad, actually, when I'm home. I spend it with Derek. And when I'm on the road, maybe my dad's there. But I do like to spend a lot of time with putting because your eyes, they change, you know, pressure, different hotels, flying a lot. Yeah. So much goes on and, and so much goes into being able to see properly. You trick yourself every week. It really messes up very basic things that you can't see properly. Xander Shoffley is a force on the PGA Tour. With four wins, a consistent major contender, and a winning President's Cup record, Xander is the face of poise under pressure. He's got something. He does have the X factor, and I don't just mean in his name. It helps when you make your putts, and he's making more than 90% of them inside 10 feet this season. Oh, yeah. Got in, boy, that's pretty rare to do that. He credits his work with Derek Uita for making a difference. While his father, Stefan, watches over his golf swing, it's Derek who partners with Xander on the putting green. Xander and Derek pride themselves on the work they have put in to improve Xander's putting dramatically through fundamentals and training aids. It's an approach both professional and recreational golfers can benefit from. So I traveled to Xander's hometown of San Diego, California to bring you new ways to train on the putting green. When we start, we talk about the eyes a lot. If you don't know what you're seeing, you're gonna have a hard time lining up, you're gonna have a hard time reading, you're gonna have a hard time aiming. So we have these lines on the ground here and we use a board that is pretty straight. I'm gonna grab it. Yep, go ahead and grab it. Call it the eye board. It's just a piece of wood. It's a piece of wood. Let's be real. We draw lines down either side yep. and they match up. So when you move it and these lines aren't connected, go ahead and stand over it, Xander. So he'll get in position and if these lines don't look like they're matching, lining up perfectly, we know he's not set up correctly. Because a lot of times when people get over this and how they turn their heads, their eyes aren't looking down this line correctly and these lines will either look pointed to the left or they'll look pointed to the right. And it just depends on who you are. Everybody's different. Depends on the day. This bottom line looks horrible to me today, but the top line looks fine. Yeah. So. But they're both fine. And when so. you're on tour, you travel obviously with a big plank, right? Typically, yeah. It fits in my golf bag sometimes. And so. you know, TSA is cool about it. <laughs> so if you, if you don't have a plank, how could you do this uh, without something like that? Yeah, so move right over here. These three balls, we use a chalk string. Pretty simple. I'll grab that. Utility it's man over here. Over here. Oh, got oh, right, it. right this way. Home Depot, four bucks. Okay. Lowe's, yeah, wherever you want to go. So um, we'll make sure it's perfectly straight. We'll line it up. Which so we're it not is. guessing. So these balls line up in a perfectly straight line. You'll put the balls flush up against the string. Flush up against the string, you know make straight. sure it's straight. To me, this would be an advanced three ball because it's the balls are nine feet apart. If I'm doing it myself, I haven't done it in a while, I might do six feet apart. And so the closer together, the easier it is. Of course. Yeah. And so that's why it's harder from 50 feet to know exactly where you're aiming. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if I'm really struggling, then I'll take a chalk line, I'll snap it on the ground, and then I'll put the balls on the line. So it sort of gives me a guide rail. Because if you step over this, you have a nightmare checking it out, yeah. looking down the line. Like this looks straight to me, but it's because I do it pretty often. Right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you were to like move farther away, for sure, it changes your heading. Your angle. optics change. Right. You know what so I mean? Now all of a sudden, it wouldn't look straight to you. Exactly. Based upon your distance, the angle of your head, all that, there's a place where you can stand where you're going to be seeing straight, and you're trying to find that sweet Correct. spot. How you stand is critical. How you turn your head is critical. My mentor, Carl Welty, has helped me with this. If you stand over it, I'll stand over it as a lefty. If my eyes turn at an angle like this, these balls, to me, don't line up so well. But if I get my neck more parallel to the ground, and now when I turn my head with my eyes more perpendicular to the ground and parallel to this line, they line up. Mm. So this is all really trying to get you to sort of see straight the way you perceive it to be in line with what actually is straight. 
If you're seeing something other than what is actually true, you're in trouble. Mm. So we do these things called play dames, where I'll give him a putt. Let's say, come on over here. Let's just say I give him six foot putt. Who's gonna read it? Definitely not Chris. I'll do a quick little read here, breaking quite a bit. So I'll say I'd like to start this, you know, at that tee. So now I'll line up. So the line on the ball, I think, for a lot of people is critical. And even when there is a line on the ball, they still can't match the putter to the ball. I mean, it depends. I think the, the line is a bit of a cheat. You know, it does, it does slow you down a little bit. But like the more I've done drills where I can see straight, I don't need the line as much. It's sort of like training wheels. I would recommend using a line on the green, but if you don't want to do it on the course, that's totally fine. But like Derek said, it's really crucial to help you aim. And you'll see sort of what we do to, to sort of calibrate what's going on, knowing where your face is aiming. And then if you're on the course, you can just free wheel it. No need for a line. The way this works is he lines up his ball. I'll set up to it. He's going to line his putter up to where he thinks the break is. And when he's ready, I'm going to come in with the plate. Got it? Yep. I'm going to move the ball out of the way, OK? So then from here, I'm just going to slide this plate in front of the putter gently so I don't move his putter. I know where he's aimed, but he can go back now and he can double check. I see. And so if he's off a little bit, what we'll do is I'll take a string line and I'll come back. And lo and behold, he's aimed to the right a little bit. All right. Here's the problem. If he's read this correctly and he hits this the speed that he wants, but he's aimed slightly to the right, this ball could miss. So Make he's got the sort of it's line. Not, it's not even that far right. Come it's on. not <laughs> even that far right. Over the years, he's gotten really, really clean with this. That's always what we're trying to do. We are not trying to remake the wheel. Right. We're trying to keep him calibrated so his aim is good, his reads are good, he's starting his ball online, he can hit at the right speed, his ball's rolling. And we have these ideas, I call them the Ten Commandments of Putting. And if he can do all these things correctly, he's going to hoop. He could now come back in, go ahead and hit it. So now this is square, so it should look a little left to me. So when I look at it, this looks a hair left to me. Now the reed's involved, because that's the spot I picked. So now I better start one online here. So the reed was good. Next on Swing Expedition. If you see the high line and you can see the low line, you can make a putt on any line in between those two points as long as you match it up. When he was a junior, I would categorically not watch him play golf. I would warm up with him, drive him to the course, drop him off at the first tee and leave. And that uh, went on, I, I can't even tell until what age, I think until college, actually. There's actually one funny story where I drop him off, I had to go on a trip, leave town. He wins the tournament. My wife had to get a phone call from the tournament organizer to pick him up in the dark with a trophy sitting on the curb, oh, no. which I th thought is hilarious, one of our favorite stories. Sander, can you expand on this and tell us how you worked through some of these issues that this may have created? <laughs> it's, one of, issues. It's, it's one of his favorite stories. <laughs> yeah, it's not yours. You know, I didn't think much of it. I didn't really care. You know, my dad made it pretty clear. We have had a very open relationship. And at a young age, he was very upfront with me on why he doesn't want to be there. Thought golf, well, you know. say why, yeah. Golf is boring to watch, for starters. And two, he told me I need to grow up. His presence on the course is sort of a comforting feeling to me, and he wanted to take that away. Mm. Now he's with me almost every week on, on the big tour, which is a comforting feeling, but I just think he's really bored and just wants to hang out. But <laughs> I'm kidding. He's a full-time swing coach. But you know, I think at a young age it sort of taught me to hold myself accountable, you know, not sort of rely on, on my dad, to fall back on when you know I'd make a double or you know, how many kids do you see at, at tournaments, you know, make a bad shot and then look at their parents, you know what I mean? Like I, I didn't have that. I had to like, you know, get in my own head and and sort of hash it out, but I think it sort of helped me develop, you know, into being a little more independent and owning up to my own and stuff. And more mature at an earlier age. Right? That, was, that was really the goal. He's an ogre for a reason. So at junior tournaments, you know, you'd get a sixth or seventh place medal, and my dad would be the one throwing it in the trash in front of other parents, and other parents would Demonstratively. Oh my gosh. You know, and I'd be sitting there like, oh, that's my dad. <laughs> it did teach me sort of, that's not what we're here for at a young age. You know, it was a little, a little brute, you know, I don't know if I'd do it with my own kid, but I don't agree with handing out trophies when someone comes in ninth place or seventh place. That doesn't breed winners, and it doesn't teach you the right thing. If you mess up and come in eighth, you messed up and came in eighth, you didn't win the thing. At a young age, made it very aware to me what we're there to do.
if you do purchase putting plates, I think it's important to have three of them. Here we have a plate with a mirror and a shoulder mirror plate, along with two plates for a left to right and a right to left, and we'll find a straight putt, whatever you want, five feet, six feet, 10 feet, 12 feet. Every week, I like to start doing this drill. I start on the straight putt here. It's simple, there's a plated mirror here so I can see my eyes. So before I even hit a putt, I'll set up to the mirror here, get comfortable. I can close my eyes if I want, similar to how I hit and sort of see where my eyes are in relation to the ball. And so each week and every day, I want my setup to be as similar as possible and have a sort of a neutral baseline before I even take this putter back. So he's got the same spacing, he's got the same forward bend, his eyes are in the same spot, his shoulders are aligned. He's trying to get his yeah. set up yeah. with his body and his eyes yeah. as consistent as possible day to day. Think about it, the daily member at your club sits in a chair all day long comes out in the afternoon, wants to do some putting. I mean, who knows how his body's gonna react to working at a computer all day long, right? Yep. But if he could check 30 seconds, done. Okay, this all looks good. I know I'm pretty good. Let's see one, Xander. Yeah. See that silky stroke. Here we go. This is point one left this, this way. My, if this misses left, this <laughs> is Derek's fault. He was rushed. It's Kaiser. He was rushed on the setup. Oh, nice. And then this is a left to right one. Safe. I patted it down. <laughs> Thank you. So when you put that tee in the ground, you start naked on the green. You put a tee in the ground, you're like, okay, that's where I want to start the ball. So then you line your plate up to it, put all your tees in, double check, pull the string to make sure it's lined up properly. Then you hit the putt. Without having anyone there, you can let this plate almost be your coach mm -hmm. because it'll tell you, did you pick a good read? Is it a firm read? Is it a soft read? Mm -hmm. When you get into a putter, you just hit putts sort of aimlessly. And so Derek, will yell at me if I don't have a tee in the ground as a reference, just to sort of know kind of where you're starting it. And he really likes the plates because it does take a little bit of time to set up, but it, it's instant feedback. You know what I mean? If you're starting it online or That's if, exactly your, right. if your speed is good or if your read is bad, and if you did everything properly, then he would actually recommend to pull the plate and move the plate to a different place. Don't just sit here and hit a hundred putts on this. You know, you see a lot of kids doing that. At some point you got to randomize it, but this is your personal coach. So what I'll have people do is I'll have them set it up without hitting any practice putts, put a tee in the ground, string it up, anchor it to the ground, and if they get it through and it misses at the speed that they like, they know they misread it, mm -hmm. right? So, so it's also a way to check if your reads correct. So this was Derek's read, which is obviously low. Yeah, because I cash everything. I go, I hit it hard. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, just from that single putt, didn't hit a tee, caught low lip, and it went about a foot past. This is a firm read. If you come back here and now, you know, I bring my caddy in, like, hey, do you think that's a good read? And he goes, well, it looks kind of high to me. Depends on the speed. I'm not going to ask him for a single read that day. Exactly. <laughs> There's been weeks where, you know, I was struggling with speed and without me even saying, you know, Austin, he's a great caddy and he said, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to mess with Xander a little bit. I'm going to pick every firm read. So this kid needs to start hitting his putts because I'm on property leaving, you know, 15 foot short, which is not what you want your pro to be doing. Tell me if you agree with this or not, but like for someone to actually hit putts at different speeds to sort of understand the high line, the low Absolutely. line, and then try to work within those boundaries Absolutely. or like a spectrum, right? For sure. Yeah, we talk about the spectrum all the time. If you see the high line and you can see the low line, you can make a putt on any line in between those two points as long as you match it up. So we say that all the time, match it up, match it up, match it up. Match the speed to that line that you chose. So if you're putting downhill, you might favor the high line because you don't want to gas it. Mm -hmm. If you're putting uphill, you might want to favor the low line because you are going to gas it. The biggest influence on me was meeting my mentor, Carl Welty. He started, I believe, the first golf school west of the Mississippi. Hmm. And then he started kind of helping Jim McLean with some of his right. schools. He has been, or he was uh, in the forefront of video. So anytime you think about Carl, you think about video. Yeah. And anybody in the golf industry thinks about video, they think about Carl. Oh my gosh, just right. the, how particular he was with video angles and how he organized all his videos and just the sheer volume of what he, he collected over the years. You couldn't, unless you were there in his house, you wouldn't believe, you, I could tell you and you'd go, no way, there's no way. And then you would see it and you'd go, this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, video that, a lot of people haven't even seen. So top meeting Carl, stuff. yeah, top secret stuff. And Carl kept everything very close to the vest. But yeah, meeting Carl and, and having him teach me 
what to look for and how difficult it was to actually get things right, that was huge for me. Okay, now that Xander's on the course playing a bit, I get to work on my own putting. Perfect. We're going through all this visual training and alignment that we talked about with the putting plates. Correct. And this is great because it's really allowing me to refine all those fundamentals for a longer putt. But once I have that down, how do I, how do I train my speed control? So we have drills and we have games. And one of the biggest ones is what I call an eyes closed time drill. Okay. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna line up to this putt and you're gonna hit it with your eyes open so you can make sure you hit it in the center of the club face. Okay. Okay, so we gotta hit the ball clean. But after that, I want you to close your eyes and tell me when this ball comes to rest. So you're gonna to have to know basically how far it's traveling and how long it's actually gonna be in motion for. Okay, so okay. I'm trying to get a sense of the time that this ball will be rolling. Correct. Now this is important for field because a big part of the speed of a putt is basically represented by how long it's, it's moving on the green. Yeah, absolutely. And on the PGA Tour where the greens are stem 12, I mean, these strokes aren't that big, but downhill putts, man, they can race away. All right, great, so let me try this. Okay. So I'm just gonna hit this 30 footer. Okay and then close my eyes and try to predict when it's gonna stop. Exactly. Now. Pretty close. Now. That was incredible. All right. And look at your speed. Yeah, pretty good. So if the average player could predict that, their lag putting would probably be pretty good. And if I was a little off, I, I would constantly be trying to calibrate that perception of how long it's rolling to actually how long it's rolling. For sure. Great example of training feel or perception of things versus real, the reality of what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Okay, now are there any games that we can play to maybe train some of this? We have a game, you can play it with a couple different people if you want. You can make a wager if you want. I would never. Uh, me either, don't gamble. <clears throat> but uh, so this first ball has to travel to that first target. Okay, so that first target in this particular game is 15 feet away. Every ball after that has to go longer than the next one. As soon as you run out of space, the game is over. As soon as you leave it short of the previous ball, the game is over. So you're trying to fit as many balls in that 15 foot space as you can. Wow, okay. Okay, so if you fit five and I fit six, yeah then you can Venmo me or however you want to pay me. Uh, uh, an emoji of a you win, yeah. There you go, there you go. All right, let's try it. Oh, ho, ho. that's a good first that ball, is right? solid. Maybe I should rattle you a little bit. That's that a, is- That's a good first ball right that there. That is Xander Shoffley-esque. And that's a good second ball. That's uh, incredible. Every single one getting past the next, the next, the next. If you happen to gas one, and all of a sudden, oh. uh, that's, in, that's incredible. So three balls within just over a foot. Good start. Yeah, I mean, think about it. So if you can do that here, hit it here, right. here, 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 tell me your speed control is not gonna be very good. So now when you start talking about breaking putts, you can see how this thing is gonna filter into the hole. Tempo is critical. If your tempo isn't correct for you, you're gonna have a hard time controlling speed. So everybody's got smartphones nowadays, so you can download a metronome on your phone. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of a metronome on steroids. We use a blast sensor. Okay. If we walk over here, we've got a lot of what we use on a day-to-day -day basis. This is, this is a lot of toys. toys. This is the blast. Yeah, this is a blast. Awesome. So you put it on the end of your putter, pair it to your phone, you can make some strokes, and now you can actually quantify your stroke in time. Mm because we believe that your stroke should always be the same time. And what changes is the length of the stroke and the speed of the stroke to vary the distance. Right. I've got a green reading putter. I've got a putter that aims itself, basically. <laughs> I've got a digital level, a wind speed meter, foot spray, figure out contact, but special balls that have a cross on it so that when we're looking at the ball, we can see whether or not it launches. So I have a perfect putter with a launch ball so we can actually see how the ball is curving. The Sam Putt Lab, hopefully most people are aware of Sam Putt Lab. It's 3D measurement of the putting stroke. We've got a very interesting putter here. Plum bobs perfectly straight up and down. A friend of mine is teaching me how to read greens with it. You talk about the future of where golf is going, now all of a sudden you have a putter that can help you read greens. That would pique somebody's interest for sure. I've got a wind speed meter that we're just starting to use putts that were breaking earlier. The wind was holding it up and it was missing high. 
So if we knew that, if I say, okay, well, I know what five miles an hour feels like and the wind's pushing it, it's not gonna break as much. Go the other way, it might make it break twice as much. These are things that are out of our control, mm. but maybe they're not, not right. if we measure it. Right. Next time on Swing Expedition, we go on the golf course to learn the best course management strategies from Scott Fawcett. Learn how to find the optimal target on every shot next time on Swing X. There's so much variance in golf, fluctuations in our body, how we perceive things. And in order to be consistent, we have to create environments or have strategies to really kind of come back to that baseline day to day to really react and be instinctive. But if our mechanics are all over the place, it becomes really hard to be instinctive because we're always fighting ourselves. We're trying to remove variables, right? So if you know where your body is and your brain knows where your body is and your feels are good and you can actually do exactly what you just did, hit the ball down your target line, we're in a good spot because now all we're talking about is speed and read. Derek, amazing stuff, man. I'm gonna be using this with my own game. Thank you for today. Thanks for bringing Xander out. It's been a lot of fun. Really have learned a lot. You got it. My pleasure. All right. You got it.